My name is Susie Jennings and I'm the founder of Operation Care International. I was a nurse by profession. I also teach Sunday school at our church, First Baptist Dallas. I grew up in a Christian home in the Philippines. I'm one of nine children. My mom was a Christian, but not my dad. My dad uh, was a gambler. He, he played mahjong, which is a table a gambling game in the Philippines. And uh, so he, he did not get saved until he was 60 years old. But I was raised in a home where my mother would take my sisters and my brothers to church. And I'm number eight out of nine children. And when I was 10 years old, I was in a church. It's an evangelical church in the Philippines. And uh, the pastor was preaching. And he, um, the Holy Spirit just touched my heart so greatly that um, I went in the front and I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. After I was baptized, I remember when our pastor um, emerged me in the sea, when I came out, I saw in, it looks like the heavens parted, like the, the sky just opened up, like the clouds opened up. Like I could, there was a different feeling in my heart, like a joy and peace. And uh, I felt like Jesus was watching while I was being baptized. I met my husband here at Dallas. He was an American. I met him in the church, First Baptist Church. And he would always talk about Israel. He would say that uh, he loved the Jewish people. And I think that my love for the Jewish people uh, was influenced by my late husband. He would talk that Jesus was Jewish. And then we need to love Jewish people. I founded Operation Care. Actually, it became a nonprofit in 2001. But actually, it started in 1993 when my beloved husband of nine years, David Jennings, left our home. And so he left our home and for a month he was missing. So during that month, I would read the Bible every day. I would read the book of Psalms and I would um, get promises of the Lord. I remember the first verse that he gave me was uh, Psalms 30 verse five that said, weeping may endure for a night, joy comes in the morning. So even though David was missing, I know God's gonna give me joy someday and so I would just cling to the Lord's, uh, the words of the Lord in the Bible. On the fourth week, God gave me the verse that said, uh, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I did not like the verse at all because I said, that's about death. And I didn't know where David was. And then on the 30th day, I got a, a knock in my door. It was a detective telling me that they found David's car in Oklahoma. I live in Texas, so Oklahoma is another state. And so we went there the next day, and we tried to locate David. They found the car, but there was no body in the car. But it was on the hill of Oklahoma, so we went there and tried to locate him. And we located, the police located him, and when we, he found David, David had been dead already for 30 days. David shot himself because of his chemical imbalance. He was suffering from a chemical imbalance called serotonin deficiency which is an imbalance in the brain that caused severe depression. And when we found him, uh, I felt like the whole world came down to me because he, we found him dead and we were supposed to grow old together. And not anymore. Uh, so he, he died and he left me. I was mad at, mad at David because he was, we were supposed to grow old together. And then I questioned why, David, why? And then um, after that, we buried David a day before Easter, and he was supposed to sing in our church on Easter Sunday. The title of his song was Heaven, and David was singing his song with the Lord in heaven because David came to know the Lord when he was a little boy. He accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And I believe that David went home to be with the Lord because it was an illness that killed him. Uh, it, it's just like cancer that would kill you. His illness killed him. If he was right in his mind, he would not kill himself. So I believe David went home to be with Jesus, and the Lord is compassionate towards him. I went at the foot of my bed, and then I raised my hand and said, Lord, what can I do for you? I tell you, never, never, never ask God what can you do for him if you are not prepared. You need to be prepared because he's going to take you out of your comfort zone. And then in October of 93, the Lord took me in downtown Dallas. We were passing by a bridge, and then me and my mother, my widowed mother was sitting next to me, and then we came from church, 
And then I heard a voice in my heart and my spirit. It was saying, look at your left side. So I look at the left side. And then I saw under the bridge about 100 men and women living in cardboard boxes. They are homeless people. And then the voice said, you're going to go there in person. And I said, no, not me. I'm not going. Those are crazy people, and they are lunatics, and they are very dirty, and they are violent. They're going to kill me. And then the voice said, you were the one who asked me, what can you do for me? So the Lord convicted my spirit, and I said, Lord, forgive me. What can I bring to these needy people? And then the voice said, blankets. So that was uh, October, and then November of 1993, immediately after the Lord spoke to me, the next day I went to Baylor Hospital where I work as a supervisor, a nurse. I was a nurse supervisor. Then I asked all doctors and nurses for $5 so I could buy blankets. So they gave me $5, and then we went under the bridge in November of 1993 and gave away 100 blankets, and we told them about Jesus, that Jesus loves them, and that Jesus cares for them. You see, we need to share Jesus first before we give away the stuff because it needs to deal with the heart. If their heart is changed, then they could have a better life because the physical things that we give, it will disappear. But if we give them Jesus, it's in their heart. So we give them Jesus and then give them physical needs. And so we went in November before Thanksgiving, gave away 100 blankets. So that was unconditional obedience. I obeyed God immediately the next day. And then in December, we had another 100 blankets and we went under the bridge again and we gave away blankets. And you could see people running, meeting us because we have blankets and we're giving them gifts. And they were happy, homeless, happy. And they were happy to welcome us in the bridge. And then that was the start of my ministry. And the homeless in Dallas called me the Blanket Lady of Dallas. That was my name. And then I, I would give blankets. Every uh, time I could see a homeless person, I gave them blankets, gave them a hug, and, and put a spiritual um, gospel tracks, tape it on, on the front of the blanket, and give it to them. And by the way, God took my sense of smell. I could not smell homeless people anymore. I don't smell their bad smell. I could smell your good smell, but not bad smell. God have a sense of humor. So I remember November 18, 2004, when we started having a birthday party for Jesus at the Dallas Convention Center. We were expecting 10,000 people on the first event. I didn't know what I was talking. God just put that in my heart. So I remember on November 18, 2004, we only had $20 in the bank. $20 for the party. We didn't have any money. It was the money given by a little boy, an eight-year-old boy, who broke his piggy bank and gave it to one of our, um, the chairman of the board and said, Mr. Batts, give this to the homeless. And then he wrote a note, God is happy with you. Happy that we're doing a party for Jesus. And that was the only money we have. And then I remembered waking up and then I knelt at the foot of my bed and I prayed. I said, Lord, we only have $20. We need your help. Your name is at stake. Your name is in trouble if we don't have any money. And the same day, I remember that was 10 in the morning. At 8 p.m., I was working at Baylor Hospital as a nurse. I got a phone call. It was from my friend who was in charge of fundraising committee. She said, Susie, I went to my friend this morning, and I asked her to help us if she could give us some money so we could have this big party. And then the friend came just from the hospital. She was taken to the hospital. Her name is Dottie Thompson. My friend's name is Diane. So Diane asked Dottie for help. And Dottie said, that's interesting because before I went to the hospital, before I got sick, I wanted to give money to charity, but I was not able to do it. How much do you need for your party so it will happen? And Diane said, we need $100,000. And then Dottie responded, said, that is amazing because that's exactly the amount I want to give. So I want to give you $100,000. So she wrote a check for $100,000. And that was the beginning of a tradition in Dallas, which now is called the largest Christmas party in the world for the homeless. It's in Dallas, Texas. So now we have from 10,000 to 14,000 people 
that attends our event. Almost 4,000 volunteers and about 10,000 homeless. And what we do with that, when they get inside, they fall in line for almost all night. There's a lot of people, thousands of them. Then when they get to the convention center, uh, we open the door, they go to evangelism one-on-one. -on -one. We pray and we tell them about Jesus. Then they go to foot washing. We wash their feet and put on socks and shoes. And then they go to sleeping bags. They take uh, blankets and then clothing and personal care items like toothbrush, toothpaste, shampoo, lotion, socks, soap. And after that, they go to uh, haircuts and makeover. Mary Kay, makeover, makeup, and then nail polish for women, and then uh, haircuts for all of them. And then they go to the food. They get food, warm meal, and also uh, entertainment for six hours, entertainment, praise and worship. And then they go to the medical area where they get flu shots, and they get blood pressure check, blood sugar check, and they also uh, get an eyeglasses, and they also have dentists to examine their teeth. And then if they needed to be referred to, we referred them to the county hospital called Parkland Hospital. And after that, they go to a telephone area where they call home. And if they get connected with their families, we take them to the bus and pay $250 per person so they could go home and they could not be homeless anymore. We have been to Israel this year. The vision God gave us is to go to Israel and Jordan. So we went to Jordan and then went to Israel. And we gave away 12,000 shoes to Syrian refugees in Jordan. We gave it to them and it was dist distributed all over Jordan. Well, the heart of the ministry is to build a school every year, one school in every country. We went to Israel this year and we helped a total of 3,800 children, Israel and Jordan together, 3,800 children. We provided backpacks and we provided uh, school supplies and socks and also uh, food for the children. And so the vision for Israel is to build a school in Israel. That's the vision God gave me. And God led us to go to Ariel, which is the capital of Samaria. It's near Tel Aviv, and it's a very safe place. So we went to Ariel in July when we did Operation Care uh, Israel. We went to Israel in July, and we went to Ariel. And we saw the land. And so we asked the mayor of, of Ariel and his assistant, Avi, what is the biggest need in your city? And he said, we need an educational building for the children. So their need fits the vision of Operation Care. So I didn't, when they told me about their need, I did not tell them that that was the vision of Operation Care. So I went home. And then when I went home, I prayed. I said, Lord, please confirm if it's really your will that we will build a school in Israel. I'm not going to email Ariel anymore. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait for Ariel to email me and connect with me through email regarding the school. And then I want them to ask us that if we could partner with them. Well, I waited and waited and waited. And it took one month. A month later, I got an email from the mayor's office asking or thanking me for visiting Ariel with my group. The operation care went there, and he was thanking us for visiting their city. And then at the end, he said, could you partner with us? That's the word I asked God to send to me. Could you partner? And that's exactly what happened. So now we are going to build a school in Ariel. And the government of Ariel, Ministry of Education, is partnering with us. The city of Ariel is partnering with Operation Care. So we're going to build a school worth $1.5 And then the government will add to that. So now our school is a lot bigger. It's going to double. So what we need is help to build the school. So we need funds. And that's really the biggest need is prayer that God will open the hearts of the Jewish people that they know that Christians all over the world are helping them. Because the Bible said in Genesis, it's Genesis 12, 3. If you bless my people, I will bless you. We're not going there because we wanted the blessing of God. We're going there because we are obeying God. He's already blessing us. 
And I know he's going to bless you if you bless the people of Israel. So come and be a part, partner with us. We're going to build a school in Israel. Dallas stands with Israel. And by the way, the school is going to be a, a gift from Dallas Fort Worth. It's not only from Operation Care. The city of Dallas will be involved. We're going to involve the city. So it's going to be from the city. It's going to be a love gift from Dallas Fort Worth to Israel. So it's going to be a gift. And so we would like you to partner with us. Anybody around the world could partner and it will be a gift given to Israel. It's not going to just be Dallas Fort Worth, but people, Christians all over the world. If you could support this school, please help us so we could build a school and help the children in Ariel, the Jewish children in the Jewish settlement in Ariel. And Ariel is a capital of Samaria and it's in the Bible. So if you're helping, blessing the people of God, God's going to